Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about sex, or sex and ADHD. I'm going to start with actually a apology. So I had originally thought I'd be talking about pregnancy, ADHD, and sex, but there was more than enough regarding the sex topic that I will put pregnancy off to a later date. I hope that doesn't sound sexist, but pregnancy will wait for another time. Today is just sex and ADHD. So the take, and maybe it's because I spent the last two weeks taking my college age children to school for the first time, and maybe I don't even want to be thinking about pregnancy and can't avoid thinking about sex. Anyway, the take home message is that people with ADHD have more sex, more risky sex, and my claim is that this may be connected to the real evolutionary reasons why ADHD is still present in our population. And <clears throat> at the end, I'm going to talk about some practical things we may do as therapists, as individuals, and as a society for dealing with some of this connection between sexuality and ADHD. So to jump into what we no, and again, like almost everything else in ADHD research, it would be wonderful to have more studies, to have larger studies, more extensive studies, but we have a fairly large number of studies that have been done. Again, not all of them have large sample sizes, not all of them were done robustly. Partly, so looking at ADHD and sexuality, particularly sexually risky behaviors, because there's a big incentive to decrease rates of sexual transmitted diseases and to decrease the rate of premature early unwanted pregnancies. Um, so what we know is that, and what I'll be saying right now is that generalizations, there's some studies that are slightly different and if those are notable, I'll point them out. But for both men and women or young adults of either gender and who have ADHD, they tend to have more partners they tend to start having sex at a younger age. They tend to have more unprotected or risky sex. They tend to have substantially more STDs at any age span in life they're looked at. And these differences aren't just a product of Western culture, Western society, because there have been studies done in Uganda, studies done in Russia, studies certainly across America and Europe, which have similar findings of all all these higher rates. Um, there's also studies that have found, particularly in people who have um, sexual dysfunction or sexual disorders in ADHD, that, that those, particularly men with ADHD, may have higher sexual desire. That's been associated, whether this is the full explanation or not, that Many people with ADHD crave more stimulation, more um, excitement, need more something to drive them because there are hypoactive dopamine systems to begin with, and they need to get a bigger oomph to trigger that system. Um, studies have found higher rates of masturbation among those with ADHD, and sort of consistent with the lower hypoactivation of the dopamine system, actual less satisfaction with their sexual lives and more dysfunction on, again, not the STD in early pregnancy, but other measures of sexual dysfunction. Now, <clears throat> many of the studies looking at these high, <clears throat> high rates of sexually risky behavior in ADHD most commonly linked it with both inattentive and hyperactive, so combined type ADHD. There's a few studies, I mean, the, the Russian study I looked at felt or only found correlation with inattentive type. So they blamed the higher number of partners, earlier propensity to be engaged in sex and the likelihood of unprotected sex to be results of not planning, of high rates of distractibility, of high rates of forgetfulness. So that all makes sense if you don't remember to bring your condoms or don't remember to get started on the IUD or don't remember to pick up your prescription for the pill, then you're more likely to put yourself in a situation where you're wanting to have sex and not completely prepared. Um, the hyperactive 
impulsive set of symptoms for ADHD certainly are also correlated with riskier behavior. So more impulsive behavior, um, more hyperactivity, you're just doing more, constantly on the go, you're more likely to bump into more people, interact with more people, probably want to be more physically active with more people. Um, so I would say my distillation of, the, of, of everything out there doesn't show that it's clearly linked to just one subset of ADHD symptoms, but maybe with a broad range of ADHD symptoms. Um, many of the studies trying to parse out or look more finely found that certainly perception of benefits is so, so people with ADHD tend to re, um, rate the immediate benefit of having sex now higher than their peers might. And concert, and the flip side of it is a what we call delayed discounting of the risks. They are less likely to be appreciative that tomorrow you might wind up with a sexually transmitted disease or nine months from now you might wind up having a pregnancy that you hadn't wanted or weren't ready for. So there's increased delayed discounting in as a factor of ADHD, which has been correlated with this higher rate of sexual risky behavior. And again, the, the increased perception of benefits in the right now has been correlated with sexual risky behavior. And some of that works well with the fact that several different studies have looked at using stimulant medications. And in general, all those stimulants can increase sexual desire and maybe most notoriously the non-prescription or non-generally prescribed stimulant methamphetamine. So not Adderall, not Ritalin, but methamphetamine um, studies have measurably found in controlled conditions that does increase sexual desire. Um, but in <clears throat> larger studies, the stimulant medications do in decrease impulsivity and maybe help prevent some of the risky sexual behavior of, of I mean, not can, but, but do measurably decrease some of the risky sexual behavior associated with ADHD. Um, so are there any factors or aspects of ADHD which may also be protective against or discouraged against sexually risky behaviors? So one of the previous talks was about rejection sensitive dysphoria or just more simply the topic of rejection sensitivity. Many people with ADHD have received multiple social rejections for being different, maybe sensitized to, I don't want to act that way or expose myself to that rejection. And that certainly could extend into romantic relationships. So they may be some subset of people with ADHD may be more reluctant or more resistant or more avoidant of sexual situations. Um, there's also correlation between, and it's, I didn't find too many scientific papers on this, but lots of discussion in more formal chat rooms and professional lectures about the linkage between premature ejaculation and <clears throat> ADHD, that particularly many men with ADHD are, are known to be premature ejaculators, which one could again set you up for more rejection sensitivity or could make you more avoidant of wanting to engage or expose yourself in those situations. Um, and there's also a lot that's written about, and again, less hard, more difficult to study, less rigorously studied scientifically, that for many people with ADHD, there's an intensity and excitement in the early stages of relationships. And then when the initial excitement fades, then the relationship, including the sexual aspects, may fade away more quickly or may be harder to sustain for individuals with ADHD than with not ADHD. Um, so that's the sort of body of work with sexual risky behavior in ADHD. And I mentioned at the start that, that I link, you know, this may be linked with why ADHD is present in our population. So what's the connection there? So, so getting back to the basics, ADHD has a very strong genetic component. Again, that's not a simple one or two genes. It's a vast number of genes, all which convey some slightly increased incidence, but the genetic, what we use as a measure of genetic um, influence is her heritability. 
and the heritability of ADHD is about 0.8 in most studies. That's comparable to the hered heritability of height. So you know, if your parents were tall, you're likely to wind up being tall. Not everyone does. There, there's certainly environmental and other factors and other genetic factors that could change or affect that. Um, so we know there's both a strong genetic component to ADHD and that ADHD is not particularly rare. So this is not schizophrenia where less one percent about the population has it. The best epidemiologic studies show that about five percent of adults worldwide, regardless of what culture, if you use the same tools for measurement and ascertainment, about five percent of adults fit full-blown clinically relevant ADHD and maybe another 5% are somewhere on a subsyndromal ADD spectrum. So that, again, is not an insignificant number of individuals with ADHD. Again, we know there's a genetic component, so people have searched for evolutionary explanations as to why this trait is in our population or why it might be valued. Since, again, in the modern world, not just stigmas and shame, but we know measurably Kids with ADHD, on average, are likely or lose are likely to live 10 years less than their non-ADHD peers. 10 years is a huge decrement. That's comparable to what severe major depression causes in terms of average life loss. It's comparable to what diabetes. Now, diabetes usually starts later in life, but 10 years of life loss is huge. So there must be some powerful countervailing evolutionary force preserving ADHD in the population. Um, so again, the leading theories have been along the lines that ADHD was valuable to hunter-gatherers and has become less valuable as we become a more settled either agricultural or agricultural industrial world. So it may be less suited to our current world, but it was more ideal for a hunter-gatherer environment where constantly moving around, constantly shifting your attention rather than being just locked in on your plot of ground or defending your castle or turret, um, so that the wandering, the exploratory, the being a generalist, dabbling in lots of things may well have benefited hunter-gatherer societies. And there's, there's some genetic evidence to suggest some possible truth to this. Um, there are other more elaborate ideas that, that particularly emigration, that, that moving into new areas may be a trait, sort of exploring, sort of the curiosity that's associated may be valuable. I'm, I would propose a sort of simpler explanation evolutionarily, and that is Evolution, we often sort of think of it backwards, and I credit Stephen Jay Gould, who was a evolutionary biologist at Harvard and wrote many popular books about the topic. He sort of highlighted one of the commonest misconceptions about sort of evolutionary psychology or evolutionary or beha biology behavior is us thinking if a trait, biological trait, is well adapted for the world right now, that must be why it adapted for. So if our eyes are particularly good at you know, good vision, we can read books. That clearly doesn't mean eyes evolved in order for us to read books. Eyes evolved to take in visual information in whatever context was relevant back millions of years ago when eyes were being developed. So some of our explanations are often post hoc in looking at our, our sort of concocted. And the basis of evolution sort of Darwin's insight is that evolution, natural selection, is working on differential reproductive success. If you get more babies into the next population and those babies have more babies, your genes are going to be perpetuated. And so I'm arguing that ADHD is still around because if you're having babies at an earlier age, if you're having more partners, if you're having more children, that's going to keep ADHD going regardless of, again, how good a fit it is now in terms of the environment and regardless of whether it may make us better explorers or may make us better hunter-gatherers or may make better things, that the simple differential reproductive success and, again, the fact that 
this sexually risky behavior is seen across cultures, again, not just a product of Western society, is, is mildly supportive of my theory. So moving back to the more practical realm, what can we do about you know, sexually risky behaviors, again, which may result in pregnancies people aren't ready for and or sexually transmitted diseases. Clearly there is a personal and societal and if you're working with patients, a doctor patient value to reducing, reducing sexually risky behaviors. So some of the best evidence we have is that stimulant med medications that are used for treating other ADHD symptoms and often sort of helping people be more prepared or productive for their classroom or their job situation. Again, ADHD is not just a cognitive process. It affects emotions, it affects behavior, it affects impulsivity and a much broader range of life, including sexual behavior. And again, we do have evidence that properly Adjusting doses and treating people with stimulant medication reduces strongly um, sexually risky behavior. So that's one potential option. Um, other op, I mean, again, many of the studies have focused on the, the difficulties with um, delayed discounting of, of discounting bad things that are coming up. Um, but further down the line rather than in front of your face here. With my work with people making, if, if they can keep a visual image, if you have a picture on your iPhone of sexually transmitted diseases you don't want or pregnancies, a baby that you're not ready to take care of and have a picture of that, that may help provide the disinclination to jumping into sexually risky behavior. Um, we can help people structure and organize their lives better so that they have either medications or condoms or other um, tools we have to present, prevent risky and dangerous sexual behavior. Um, so jumping back to the other sort of sexual dysfunctions or problems that's, that ADHD can intertwine with regarding sexuality, again, we talked about one of them is that many people with ADHD get excited, over-involved, over-aroused, over-charged at the beginning of a relationship, and then when the novelty fades, there's less to sustain them, and they, so in the sexual realm, that can involve even keeping with the same, this is presuming keeping with the same sexual partner is a good thing, and I'll get to that in a moment, but one way is introducing, this is sort of standard sexual, um, sexual therapy 101, introducing variety. So you may experiment with different positions. You may experiment with different language or absence of language when you're having your sexual behavior. You may experiment with um, different times of day, different locations, different dressing up or non-dressing up in different ways. So there's a lot of ways to add creativity or using creativity to add novelty, excitement, variety, even if you're maintaining sex with just one behavior. In terms of dealing with the problem of um, premature ejaculation, I'd say it's a last resort. There are medications, particularly Paxil and other SSRIs that have been used. But my emphasis, again, this is sort of sexual therapy 101, is decreasing the focus on orgasm being equal, uh, equating orgasms with sexuality. There's a whole host and range of ways of being sexually active, sexually satisfying each other without just focusing on having an orgasm or not. And then the sort of larger point I want to make about sexuality and ADHD is that 50 years ago or when I was growing up, which is scary, success in the business world was fairly strongly equated with you'd have one career for your whole life and that was you know someone who jumped from career to career that was a failure or something was wrong with you or something wasn't quite normal or that wasn't as good a success now our whole world and the workplace has largely changed there certainly are some professions where staying and doing the same thing forever is considered the epitome of 
of, of career success, but now particularly in Silicon Valley, other startups, given the whole change in how much our workplaces, our what jobs are non-existent now that were prevalent years ago, it's much more common to value and appreciate someone did this for 10 years and something else did this for 10 years. I think we need to translate more of that to our relationships and romantic lives and sexual lives. So again, right now, I would still claim, and if you look at the obituary page or celebrations page, you know, someone's been married 50 years, that's considered, again, the pinnacle of success, the ultimate form of relationship. I'm not challenging that long-term monogamous relationships may be the easiest in terms of managing children and families. Other people are constructing other models successfully. But I think, particularly if children aren't involved, why would be one 50-year relationship more valued, more valuable, more wonderful, more impressive than having five really good 10-year relationships or even 10 really good five-year relationships. So we, we hold these societal ideals. And again, if they work for you, great. But if they don't work for you because of how your brain is constructed, I would say feel free, as long as it's not harming other people, to construct the life in the way that works for you. So you may have experienced much more and a, a greater breadth of life with equal amounts of depth by exploring, again, five really good 10-year relationships rather than one 50-year relationship. So that's the end of my soapbox here. I'm losing track of what my next talk is going to be next week. I will be talking about pregnancy, but I already have <clears throat> this September schedule, so it will not be September, it will be October. Oh, actually, I am remembering. I will be out of town again next Friday the 10th, so the next time I'll be talking is the 17th. I will, the topic will be posted soon. Have a good, safe, not just safe sex, but safe life, safe health, happy health. Good week. Bye for now.